everyone, I'm Liz Brown Swanson and you are watching RPV City Talks Special Public Safety Edition. It's great to hear, have here in our studio the captain of the Lumita Sheriff Station, Captain James Powers, back for his quarterly report to let us know what's going on with crime trends and also public safety information that it will be very important for you, our residents watching. So with that, I'm going to just start with how are you? It's been a few months since we've had you here. I'm doing very well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, I know you've been busy, and uh, we bring you in after you meet quarterly with the uh, Peninsula Regional um, the Contract Committee, the law, Regional Law Contract Committee, and you just met with um, from Rolling Hills Estates and Rancho Palos Verdes and, of course, um, the uh, City of Rolling Hills, and you shared what's going on with the latest crime trends and statistics. What do you want the community to know? You know, as I watch the crime trends, um, they, they've, in the last year, they've kind of been all over the place with the pandemic and COVID and lockdown. And so I had been focusing on, uh, specifically on assaults, uh, for one, uh, because they, they increased dramatically uh, across the county and not just in our jurisdictional boundaries. And I think I, in the last meeting, I touched upon that a little bit as far as being be, uh, people being cooped up and just being restless and frustrated um, and nervous and scared about what, you know, what, what the future holds for us. Um, I can say that in checking our crime stats, our assaults have dropped. So that's a good thing. I think people are uh, a little bit more relaxed now. They're, they're being put at ease. The vaccinations are out. Um, the, the, the restrictions are being lifted, so to speak. And uh, hopefully in the, in the next month, uh, they'll be you know, loosened up even more. So that, that's a good thing. Another good thing is um, we were going to open the show up with some exciting news that our city, Rancho Palos Verdes, was named the fourth safest city in the state and we're up from sixth. What do you say about the fact that we've gone up to number four and how are we going to become number one? Well, first of all, I don't, <laughs> want to I don't want to take all the credit because it's not, that's not the way it works. And I've, I've talked about this and I've talked about see something, say something. I've talked about the importance and value of partnerships in the community. And so I look at this as a victory for not only the city, uh, the Sheriff's Department of Law Enforcement, but for the, for the society, for the community in itself. It's a victory across the board. Uh, and I can't, help but to, to improve there's always room to improve uh, the 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 best way to be number one is to eliminate crime in itself right. uh, is that a reality and a fact uh, that can you know that's that, that can be obtained I would I would love to say yes but I've yet to see it uh, and so I can't help but continue to reinforce the value of partnerships the value of the community policing the see something say something um, mm -hmm. it's really really important that if you see something that doesn't look right to call my station and to report it, report any suspicious activity. And, and, I, and I say that because I don't, I read stuff on social media and I'll follow up on it. And there's things that I'll see on social media that I didn't even know about. Mm -hmm. And so it's important that you call us. You, you wanna post on social media and knock yourself out, but that's not a form of reporting uh, crime to law enforcement or suspicious behavior or suspicious activity. It needs to be called into the station and let us go out and respond and investigate that and then post it on next door. Back to meeting with your regional um, contract law meeting. Um, what were the takeaways from that meeting? And if there's anything else you want to report, because that's where you, you know you sit there and you talk to the city officials um, about what's going on. Again, my concerns are going to be the same: uh, larceny, thefts, uh, burglaries, uh, and any crime. And 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 so earlier in the year, my numbers were up, and I'm hoping that they drop a little bit. They are a little bit lower than they were before, and so I'm, I'm hoping that that downward trend will continue. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, you know, as far as um, things that I've done differently from the beginning of the year up until now, I shouldn't say it's different, but I'm focusing on visibility. And what I'm asking my deputies to do is to just drive around residential neighborhoods and to be seen. And just the, the mere visibility of a, of a black and white patrol car going through a neighborhood, hopefully that's enough to deter somebody that's up mm -hmm. to no good. The visibility goes a long way. It reinforces a, a lot of things with the community. It puts them at ease a little bit that we're out there. And uh, I want to continue to do that. And so, um, you know, and then proactive law enforcement. Uh, my deputies are out there. They're, they're stopping cars. They're catching people. And uh, they, unfortunately, there's people out there that are up to no good. Uh, that's the bad news. The good news is my deputies are arresting a lot of people that they're out there and they're catching them. And that's the good news. And you've been catching them when it comes to grand theft autos. The, the numbers you were saying were, were up, but the, so are the arrests. So I want to talk about that number. So grand theft autos, year to date, there's been 14 vehicles stolen in the city of Rancho Palos Verdes, year to date. However, 
we've made 30 arrests for people in stolen vehicles. So what that tells me is that uh, the bad guys are coming up here in stolen cars looking to do other things. And uh, so the technology and the investments of the cities, uh, of Rancho Palos Verdes and, and the neighboring cities, their investments are paying off. And they've invested in technology uh, that's helped us uh, catch these folks. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's a good thing. And so when I go to my monthly meetings with my executives and they say, why do you have 14 Grand Theft Autos? And I say, well, I've had 14 Grand Theft Autos, but I've had 30 arrests. And then they, you're just like, wow, okay, that's, that's unheard of. And so, uh, like I said, proactive law enforcement from the deputies. And even these trying times, they're still out there doing what needs to be done. And that's, that's the good thing. You talk about the proactiveness of your deputies um, out there and through the help of technology making these stops. Um, I met said to you before on camera, like these routine traffic stops turn into something a lot bigger. Um, but you said there's no such thing as a routine traffic stop. I was, when you go on the uh, social media page for your station on Facebook, you just see it all playing out. You see what was a traffic, someone got pulled over and then all of a sudden there's guns and drugs in the car. Like, how, what, how, tell me what happens when deputies experience that, what they go through. They're looking for that. And, and when, they, when they're able to find it, uh, whether it's, you know, versus the, the, a car being stolen or the vehicle license being wanted, whatever, whatever the circumstances are, um, you know, they're trained to recognize that. They're trained to, to dig a little bit deeper and to investigate and to look for different things, uh, behaviors, uh, you know, nervousness uh, of, of the, uh, of, you know, of the, the people in the cars. And one thing leads to another. And so, yeah, there, uh, there's a lot of narcotics arrests, uh, even though with Prop 47, it's a misdemeanor, they're still out there. Uh, seizing the narcotics and in the last couple of months they've made some seizures that are significant not just you know simple possessions but possession for sales where they've actually recovered pounds of methamphetamine uh, that that's that's not common and the fact that they're able to do that um, I, I couldn't be more proud mm -hmm. um, during your quarterly regional law contract meeting um, you brought up uh, an incident an example of what happened when there was a car that approached rolling hills at the to our 2 a.m. in the morning. Can you tell us about that story and how, again, great detective work um, by your deputies paid off? So, <clears throat> yeah, very good follow-up work from the deputies, but it started with the guards at the gate. And they were they hills. were attentive at, at Rolling Hills. Uh, they denied some people entry based on their behavior and their demeanor, and they, they felt that they, were, they didn't belong there and the guards knew it, and so they turned them away. And then What's really important is they called our station and reported this suspicious activity. Again, see something, say something. They did that. My deputies were able to, to find the car um, a little bit later, uh, stop the car, and one person had an arrest uh, or a warrant for his arrest, and the other person had a gun that was not registered with the Department of Justice, which is what we refer to as a ghost gun. So there's no doubt in my mind that those two individuals were up to no good, and the Lord only knows what they were about to do or to attempt to do. But uh, they were arrested and taken off the street, and that's one less gun on the street. Mm -hmm. Of course, when you look at the arrest record, um, that does document sort of the success of what you're doing with your team. Um, and there's been recent crimes solved, like, for example, um, we were hearing about uh, serial um, uh, robberies that were taking place at Trader Joe's in the South Bay, including here in Rancho Palos Verdes. We understand now that both the father and son that were involved with that case um, had pled guilty. Um, your deputies were all part of that investigation, and it, how did that all play out? And what do you think your community needs to know now that these that the, the two individuals are now you know in jail? Well, I mean that that type of situation is unfortunate. When you have a, a father son type thing, that's mm -hmm. uh, that's pretty sad. I, I mean, what happened happened. I can tell you that um, two of our Trader Joes uh, got hit uh, one once. Uh, one was. Um, probably going to get hit a second time and some uh, undercover work through Trader Joe's and through, uh, through law enforcement were able to interrupt that and it spooked them and they, they uh, decided not to do that. But um, they were caught, I don't remember what community they were caught in, but they were doing robberies throughout Southern California, not just in the South Bay area, they were doing it in Southern California. And uh, unfortunately, you know, um, like I said, that was a sad thing, but uh, you know, mm -hmm. they were apprehended and, and they're they're paying the price now and they're being held accountable. So as far as the safety of Trader Joe's, um, I, you know, it's, it, it's unfortunate that that type of behavior happened. Uh, there's no need to not 
uh, go to Trader Joe's and <laughs> to give them your business. It's a local community store, and they're, they're, the, mm -hmm. the management there has been very, very proactive, very supportive. I was in communication with them after the first robbery and after the second and at the conclusion of that. And so Trader Joe's, they put forth efforts of security. Uh, they've enhanced their security uh, uh, surveillance systems and, and their processes as well and, and learn from it to try and prevent things from happening in the future. So mm -hmm. uh, Trader Joe's is a safe place. Right. Uh, the community is safe. As for our residents out there that wonder, is one neighborhood in RPV safer than the other right now? And I know that at your meetings, um, it's brought up like, do we, do we see trends in certain neighborhoods that you're following? Um, what would you want to share on that? I know, for example, there is that tool called crimemapping.com yes. that we can go on and it's on the city website. It's a great tool to see like what's happening where. So can you kind of expand and elaborate? Is there a way to kind of say where the trends are, if there are? So the general public can go into the crimemapping.com uh, and, and search for cities and look for crime trends. We have a very similar system at the station that uh, my crime analyst manages. And um, I used uh, screenshots of that system at the last regional law meeting. And what I did is I replaced the uh, the traditional bar graph that showed numbers and I, I just saw, um, we all saw a duplication of slides and I'm like okay there's a slide with numbers on it and here's a, a, another slide with a bar graph on it. So what we did is we we took a screenshot of, of our dashboard of crimes and I put it up there and, and just to show as an example and I, I like it. I think it was uh, very very visual for mm -hmm. the for the public to see and for the, the committees to see. Um, I look at that system probably almost daily, if, if sometimes multiple times in a day, depending on what, you know, what I'm looking for. But I use it in, in a way to uh, look for, for any types of patterns, whether it's days of the week or, or locations. There's technology in that system that allows us to uh, look for times of day, days of the week, um, and location. Uh, in any types of behavioral patterns, you know, vehicles, whatever it may be, suspect description. Uh, it, it replaced the traditional pin map from the, the 70s cop show um, or, the, you know, law enforcement practices, and it's a, it's a digital form of that. And right now there's no patterns. It's sporadic. It's, it, they're, so there's we, not a hot spot. Then. No. We, yeah. we have crime, but there's no hot spots. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. in the, there's, I, I'm not seeing anything. And if I did see something... Um, I would have a team on it long before we talk about it on TV. <laughs> right. And I know in my own neighborhood, and I've said it before on this show, that years ago, my house, I was I was burglarized during the middle of the day, and it was like three houses on my street, and I said, like, why my house? Why not, why not the house next door? But then two more houses down, and we had this conversation, like, you know, why are they picking this house and not that house? What can you share about that that might be helpful as prevention? What I, what I can share with you on that is... Um, when I, when I see, for example, a residential burglary occur, I will look up that address and I'll do a street view on Google and I'll look at the house and anything I can look for as to why they picked this house versus the house next door to the left or the right or the house across the street for that matter. Mm -hmm. And then I'll, I'll also look at different homes on that street. Um, and I know sometimes the Google Maps are not uh, accurate, up to date, you know, real time. And there's times where I'll drive down the street. There's times where I'll drive, um, and if there's certain, something unique about that, uh, I may even, you know, introduce myself to the victim and look for something like uh, that, that might be a clue. I've done that before, I, and I, I have no problem doing it in the future, but um, that's what I look for, and I, I can't figure that one out for the life of me. Mm -hmm. uh, what I can tell you, though, is um, I've seen examples where there's construction, right. uh, there's, there's hired help, uh, whether it's construction or, or gardening, and that, that doesn't mean anything, but sometimes it, it could be a clue. And there's things that we look at, and um, nine times out of ten, I'll talk to a neighbor that they might have something, and I'm like, well, I thought something wasn't right, but I didn't want to share it, I didn't want to report it, and those are the things that need to be reported. Mm -hmm. If it amounts to nothing, then so be it. It's a harmless phone call, and I have a deputy come out and talk to you about something. Uh, if, if it doesn't lead to anything, that's, that's perfectly okay. But again, it, it develops a relationship between the resident that calls and my deputies that are patrolling the streets, which is what's really, really important to where that level of communication um, exists and continues to exist. That's, that's the key here. Right. Um, I want to just switch gears for a minute. Um, we're sitting here. We're still six feet apart. Um, things are changing rapidly. The community continues to reopen up. We are 
Um, we still have, though, have our guard between us, but I just want to find out more about, as we come out of this pandemic, how your team has done and the station, how you're recovering from all this and, and, and the impact as things are becoming open up again and how that's impacting your daily life over at Lanita Sheriff Station. So up to date, we really haven't implemented any change, even though um, there has been changes through the CDC and, and mm -hmm. the state and the county. Uh, they're easing up. We haven't got any formal instructions as far as the department easing up. Still wearing my mask. I wear it around the station. Uh, my deputies are still wearing it uh, when, they, when they need be. And, and so we're waiting for that. As far as impact of the station, you know, I, I had some illnesses uh, during the holidays. Right around Thanksgiving is when we got hit. Uh, nothing significant. Everybody's returned back to work. Um, and the department's offered the vaccinations. And so... Um, some people have chosen to get them, and I, 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 we're not tallying up who has and who has not. Mm -hmm. um, there, if you look at the numbers, there are still people that don't want to get the vaccination, and that's entirely their decision. And what about the ability to bring volunteers back? Are you still working on that? Like, for example, your vacation checks, those kinds of services done through volunteers. What can you tell us about that? So the volunteers, uh, were they were restricted, and they're, they've eased up a little bit where they've allowed us to bring some of them back. Mm -hmm. We're not back to 100% yet. We're still waiting for that. I'm hoping to see that um, in the near future or at least by the 15th of June when things are supposed to be uh, changing again. Because you get a lot of help from volunteers. That's oh, yeah. important. Absolutely. And they're, they're worth their weight in gold. Mm -hmm. um, we, they do a lot for us. I mean, they, they do vacation checks. They, do, uh, they deliver materials to and from the Hall of Justice, you know, um, the, you know our mail runs or whatnot. Uh, they do stuff in the community. They help with our our, um, our weapons training. Yeah, they, they do a lot for us. And, um, I, yeah, I, I can't wait to have them back full time. Great. Um, you always emphasize the importance about community policing. Um, you're going to have a town hall. It's going to be um, at Hess Park. And by the time the show is running, it's on May 27th um, at 6 p.m. Correct. Um, what are your goals that you have for that meeting? And well, my goals are just to, to communicate with the, with the community, f see if there's any needs or concerns. And uh, a lot of times they'll have questions and they want explanations of certain things. And if I can provide that explanation, I will. And if I can't, I'll explain why I can't. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's just, like I said, it's, it's communication is a key component of community policing. You know, there's a level of partnerships that exist between members of the community and law enforcement. And, you know, I can't emphasize uh, the importance and value of that. Yeah, that's, that's, how, that's how the city earns rankings of being the safest city in the nation. Uh, that's, that's how you do that. And, and like I said, the communication and the partnership part of that is foundational. Mm -hmm. Are you expecting any specific current concerns to come up? Are you already prepared for it? Or? No, I mean, I, I look at, um, you know, preparations for regional law, my monthly crime management meetings, uh, statistics, any, any trends that I see, um, I will share. Mm -hmm. uh, any concerns I have, I will share. Um, again, as I stated earlier, you know, larceny thefts is a big deal. Uh, and so one of the things I'll, I will inf reinforce with all of the members of that town hall is to lock your valuables up, lock your cars, mm -hmm. keep valuables out of plain sight, uh, park your car in a well-lit area, park in your garage, uh, mm -hmm. you know, all, all the do's and don'ts uh, to help prevent crime. How important do you think, you know, we talk about layering, like, you know, you can have a sign out in front that said, you know, there's security cameras here, all that, everything works. We have the ring doorbell systems. Last time we talked the fact that lock safety cameras are being installed. So all of that helps. Is there anything that you think has been really instrumental that you think residents should be aware of when it comes to technology, is it having cameras? Cameras are very, very helpful. And I know that there's been a couple of examples and I can't think of any specifics offhand, but I do know for a fact uh, listening to some of the detectives that have solved some crimes mm -hmm. based on surveillance video from homes, from residences, uh, you know, next door neighbor or whatnot, whether it's a ring camera or surveillance camera, to help us put a suspect uh, in a certain location, uh, identif even identify sometimes through facial recognition and whatnot. And you see the face, you see the picture, and, you, you know, you can, when you catch somebody or detain somebody, you know, like, yeah, that's the same person that, that we've got on video here. And so that just, it, it just validates, and, and that can be the difference between a case getting filed with the district attorney's office versus a DA reject. Um, and, and so it's very, very important. 
What is what are your biggest challenges right now as the captain of Lameda Sheriff Station that you might want to share? Hmm. I mean, money's always a challenge. Uh, budgets, yeah, budgets, budgets are always season. an issue. Uh, you know, Sheriff's Department's facing the you know the budget budget deficits, and uh, we we've been facing those since I've arrived. Um, I've got some ideas. I know COVID has impacted the communities. Uh, I, I know I, in, in my discussions with all the city managers, we've just renewed our, um, I've just given them the uh, contract renewals for all the city managers to review. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the good news is there's no budget cuts uh, from, from that perspective. Um, and, you know, maybe down the road, we can, we can look at some, some other alternatives. There's, there's uh, all of the cities have provided uh, supplemental overtime for different things, whether it's traffic enforcement or crime suppression. Um, and those are very, very effective tools that allow us to do a little bit more than just our regular routine service. Mm -hmm. um, we're getting into the summer months, and I don't know how that impacts your operations and um, anything you want that you prepare for now that it's summer, and especially now people are going to be very excited to be out and about more than ever. So again, uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to focus on the visibility of my deputies. I know the city's concerns, um, visibility is one of them, traffic enforcement is one of them, response times are one of them. And so I'm, I'm trying to uh, uh, implement some, some ideas and some suggestions um, that are going to be trial, trial and error. Um, I, I got three new sergeants assigned to the station uh, just a little over a month ago. Um, and so I, I lost some sergeants, but I've gained some. And so um, I'm counting one of them as kind of an extra because I had one sergeant that was... Um, it was off on an injury that's been off on an injury since I arrived at the station. And so that person um, retired and I've, I've got what I call an extra body now. So mm -hmm. um, I've got plans for that person. Um, I've implemented that. I'm trying to do some other things um, proactively to, you know, just to, to reinforce that. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we got some funding for a summer enforcement team. However, that's in the county areas. And so uh, what that did is it allowed me to take two deputies for four months and put them in a no-call no uh, enforcement car just to go out and to enforce laws. And so that's, that's kind of like throwing a dog a bone a little bit. Um, it's, it's very appealing. So what I did is instead of just selecting this two. This is the first time I think I've discussed the no-call enforcement car on the oh, show. Oh, I love it. It's, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. I did one for many years as a street cop, and they're a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, you can be very, very proactive. And, and there's, there's a method of my madness here. But with what I did with these two deputies is I split it up in half. And so instead of two deputies for four months, I did two de four deputies for two months. So two, two deputies for the first two months, two more deputies for the second two months. I took that extra sergeant, which I don't have funding for, and that sergeant's going to be, it'll be a collateral assignment. And I did it for two sergeants for both halves. And so uh, it's, it's a morale builder. Mm -hmm. um, and, and working a no-call car, and the city has suppression money. We do the same thing, um, but it's it's not full time. It's maybe for an eight-hour shift once a week. It's the same concept, but this is full time mm -hmm. for four months, and um, you know that that's huge. Talk about is there any other programs or goals that you want to highlight coming up that that you know you just talked about the no-call cars, things like that that you want to share. That you're excited about so what I've done and what I did when I interviewed for this job almost two years ago is I gave each city manager an action plan and that was those are my ideas mm -hmm. of what I want to do and I, I knew when I first got here not to do it right away so now I'm, I'm slowly but surely integrating my action plan into a practice okay. and um, you know sometimes New ideas are met with resistance. Sometimes people resist change. Um, I talk about visibility. I, I'm a, I am a, an advocate of visibility. It's important. And through my own experiences, and I don't know if I've shared this before, and if I have, then so be it, I'll repeat it. But uh, years ago, I drove down some streets when I worked patrol that I'd never been down before. And I discovered, uh, I discovered that on accident. And when I did, when I went down those streets, people would come out and they asked me why I was there. And I said, I'm just driving down your street because I've never been down your street before. And they didn't believe me. They, they truly thought something was wrong. I'm like, no, I'm just, this, I, I learned this on accident. It was a, it was a, a, it was a whim, but it's effective. Mm 
And mm-hmm. when people, they notice you. And so I'm trying to instill that in my deputies. And what I'll do is I'll log on to, to my computer system, whether it's after hours or on a weekend or whatnot. And I'll say, hey, do me a favor. Drive down a residential street. Look on the back of your maps and drive down a residential street you've never been down before. Mm-hmm. And just, just drive down there. And if you see somebody out there, stop and introduce yourself. So community policing, visibility, communication, relationship building. And so there's an acronym that I learned a long time ago, and it's called PAVE. And we made fun of my lieutenant that came up with that acronym, uh, but I'll eat crow because I believe in it. It stands for Partnership, Accountability, Visibility, and Enforcement. And that's what I'm trying to implement. Mm -hmm. So that's my plan. Um, and we're doing we're doing different things to instill that, and I it's working. You're definitely it, paving your way here on the peninsula. It's working, and uh, I you know I, I want, you know there's always room for improvement. So I just want to I want to do whatever we can to to improve. We're filming the show during the uh, month of May, and um, the week of May 9th was National Police Week, um, established by President Kennedy <clears throat> to honor um, all the uh, law enforcement officers that have served. And and also sacrifice their lives in the in the line of um, work. Um, it's a tradition that's gone on for years. I just wonder what you um, feel your the importance of having this week, especially now when we've dealt with coming out of COVID and the social unrest and the defund the police movement. Like what this week, why it's really important to have something like this. So we do this every May, and I'm very very passionate about it. Um, you'll notice I've, I've got a black band on my badge. Um, and last week, mm-hmm. there was two officers in, in California that were killed. Uh, San, Luis, uh, San Luis Obispo detective was shot and killed, and uh, a police officer from the city of Sto- uh, Stockton was also shot and killed. And, uh, you know, I, I've told you before, I teach the academy. Um, I have uh, an Officer Down Memorial app on, on my cell phone. It's on my desktop and my computer. And so every time an off- a peace officer in, in the country is killed, I get a notification. And so I'm very, very passionate about that. Um, you know, I look at everything that's going on in society, whether it's a defund the police movement, uh, budget cuts, civil unrest, whatever it may be. Um, I, I look at a couple of things that I focus on. And I don't dwell on things I have no control over. I, I focus on the things I do have control over. And the way I conduct my business, uh, the influence I have on my deputies, uh, that's what I focus my, my efforts on. And I look at the nobility of the job, why we all signed up. And I'll tell you that if, if I have any bad apples in my station, I'm going to deal with it. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make that right. And I can tell you I'm very, very proud of the men and women that work at my station. They do a very, very good job. And, you know, I, I ensure that they're proactive, that they're ethical, and they're professional. Mm-hmm. And I, I've yet to see anything that is contrary to that. Um, and I'm just going to move forward through this. Just one last concluding statement. Uh, if you follow our social media page, you'll see that there was a, uh, we, we lost an employee uh, last week, Diana McWhorter, my station operator. Uh, she's been at my station for oh, almost 25 years. Um, an amazing lady, very giving, very selfless. Uh, my, as soon as I arrived at the station, uh, when I introduced myself to her, she was working on a project. And I arrived in June. She was working on a project for schools, for back to school for kids. Um, that were, you know, at risk or, or you know, less fortunate than others. Uh, always involved in projects to give, give to, to children, to, to the, the less fortunate of society. You know, help battered women during the holidays. Help the homeless. And um, she, uh, she was hospitalized a few months ago. And unfortunately, uh, you know, she passed away last week. And it's, it's very sad, very unfortunate. And... Um, she's going to be sorely missed. And so if you could keep her in your thoughts and prayers, I greatly appreciate it. We did a, a, a fundraiser for a few weeks ago. It was aired on uh, Channel 2, did a little, a little story on it, and it was on Channel 2, Channel 9. And, um, you know, we raised some, some funds for her to help her and her family uh, get through this challenging time. Mm-hmm. And so if you could remember her, I greatly appreciate it. My condolences. She was beautiful inside and out and the best greeter at your station. And um, and so I, in, in her honor, we would like to, in her memory, close this show. And um, thanks again, and we'll, we'll, we'll have you back here um, in no time to continue updating our community and what's going on. And with that, we are going to end this edition of RPV City Talk on the Road. I'm Liz Brown Swanson. Thanks for watching.